I'd like to thank the forum for having me here to talk to you and to thank all of you for coming out despite all of the competing sports events, which I've heard about for this evening, to come out to hear a little bit about our small practice um, based in New York. So I'm going to share some different projects with you. We are Architecture Research Office, and as, as Mark said, I joined our office when there wasn't a ton of building going on, straight out of grad school um, in 1997. And my partners, um, Stephen Cassell and Adam Urinsky, founded the office in 1993. So I've since become a partner. And um, we have a 30-person studio based in New York City that uh, embraces a radical diversity in types of work, largely in the Northeast, but also around the country. And that diversity is important for us because it, it takes the shape in terms of varied programs, uh, public spaces and private spaces, varied scale and budget, everything from a chicken coop out in the Hamptons to a major stadium in the heart of Cincinnati for the University of Cincinnati Bearcats, and now, uh, equally importantly, FC Cincinnati for all you soccer fans. I'm a soccer mom, so I have to say that. Um, and uh, projects and university campuses around the country and still doing single family homes. So that diversity of work, you know, Mark referenced our collaborative process. We have a very collaborative studio and the diversity of work for us is kind of a cornerstone to how we approach both our projects but also how we engage our clients and um, each of their individual opportunities uh, with building projects. The core kind of thread in all of that work, I like to say, I'm also amused that Mark referenced not a lot of thinking and a lot of building. We like to pride ourselves on bringing um, a combination of a love and craft of the material kind of tecton tectonics of making architecture uh, through material studies and um, iterative, an iterative design process. So we pride ourselves on that kind of invention that happens at the level of the surface or the exploration of masonry or thinking about joints and detailing, but really combining that with what we like to say is sort of strategy and intelligence, bringing to those uh, thought partners who are our clients a very deep, engaged process of inquiry where we try to learn about them, about their organizational challenges, the opportunities they have in their project, in order to distill from that research um, a set of principles or goals for what could happen through their architecture. So trying to unite the beauty and form of making with strategy intelligence to create great spaces that are very um, tied to place and mission driven for our clients. So I'm talking about that a little bit in terms of our engagement, how we think about engagement with different clients through, through the architecture that we've created over the past um, now like 26 years. So I'm gonna talk about those terms a little bit through eight projects tonight. I'll go quickly, I know we're on a schedule. Um, and I'm gonna start with one uh, academic project for an independent school in the Bronx, in the Riverdale section of the Bronx, which is actually on the uh, west side of the Bronx on the Hudson River, uh, where we did a, um, a lower school uh, academic building for primarily students in the third and fifth grade. So here you can see um, the campus here on the left, really gorgeous campus where the building is actually nestled into the hillside between the Hudson River and the hill. For this school, they have two campuses and the lower school campus is just for kids aged K through five. Our building is really targeted to kids aged um, grades three through five and it nestles in between two Victorian houses here along this kind of necklace of buildings that defines the campus. This school was envisioned to be, I mean, the campus and the, and the pedagogy of this school is that the students are very much engaged with their environment and the world around them, so kind of creating creative and curious intellect, little, little intellects, I guess. Um, but that they're also outside on a campus, which is pretty unusual in New York City, and that was something that we really wanted to take advantage of in the design. One of the challenges here was also just think, saying, how do you reorganize that campus in a way where you can build a big building, or a biggish building, in the center of an active campus with like six-year-olds running around? Um, and how do you do that within like one year so that the building and the campus can kind of continue to um, thrive uh, during construction. And so we actually took all of the ideas we had 
in, um, for the building in terms of flexibility and creating common collaborative spaces, those things I'll talk about in a minute a little bit more. And we talked to the headmaster about saying, well, can we turn those things into a temporary, what he coined the learning complex, which we thought was kind of funny, um, a temporary campus of uh, classrooms that enacted the relationships that we were creating in the building, where finally for the first time students, I mean this sounds sort of obvious and straightforward, but the previous building that they had was not purpose built and was very idiosyncratic. So we were kind of addressing all of those challenges with our project. So taking all of the students and starting to do really simple but important things like saying, let's gather classrooms together. They have a lot of co-teaching at their school. Let's combine classrooms and places where they can then have common spaces that serve that grade. Let's give those students a sense of identity. And for us in this project, let's do all of that for one whole year in essentially classroom trailers set up on their field while the building is being built. So this was really important for us. It was important for faculty because they got to start teaching and evolving how they taught in ways that we envisioned in the new building. And we learned from how they occupied these spaces and brought that learning into how we thought about furniture and finishes uh, in the real project or in the final project. Those, this complex is centered around these studio spaces in the center um, where there's a look studio and a make studio. We worked with Open, Scott Stoll of, Stoll of Open, who's a graphic designer, and they did this whole um, process of engaging the students where they chose colors and graphics and every class had their own um, flagpole in the center of their campus area. This is actually from the um, flag raising ceremony when they opened the complex. So we really turned what was a hassle and a kind of challenge into an opportunity. And Dominic Randolph, the headmaster, likes to say that every student who went through this process, like this was their memorable experience on this campus because only certain students got to, got to occupy those buildings. This was the final building that was completed a year later for the students. Two-story building nestled into that hillside where most of the classrooms faced directly out onto exterior spaces. So as I said, this campus was really defined by the fact that kids go in and out of buildings much like you would on a campus or a university campus. And their direct experience of the exterior and understanding the world around them was an important, um, is an important part of their curriculum. So a very simple and straightforward plan with two anchors on either end, unified by a commons or corridor in the center with staircases that promote circulation through this building. That's the ground level floor. You can see those doors and windows that open out directly to the outside um, with exterior learning areas that are shared between classrooms. All of this kind of in the um, spirit of promoting the collaborative work that, that the faculty takes on with their students. The same kind of plan on the upper floor, uh, those anchors being multi-purpose theater and student center on the other end, which has cafeteria and multi-purpose classrooms. But again, these kind of um, common corridor accents that were um, highlighted um, and organized to allow for breakout space from the classroom. So here you can see that front facade again, um, all the kids kind of out on recess, and then thinking about really functional and um, um, performative classrooms that support work. So everything in the classroom was sort of uh, designed, obviously the windows with this great view of the river, but thinking about all the cabinetry and millwork and the lockers, thinking about functional surfaces that are writable and that had prompts on them to kind of support um, support student work. And then the hallways, which also break out those functional surfaces for writing and pinning up and um, benches to sort of support breakout work for the students. You can see different graphics integrated into the project. And then what you're seeing above is a number of skylights where we integrated different installations so that the kids would kind of understand the world around them. So on the left, a diagram of like, a, you know, essentially a sundial, and on the right, a diagram or a rendering of um, diacroic glass. All of these installations had signage components so the kids could be aware of like this, you know, both their environment, sustainability features of the building, and kind of really make it a place that that echoed and resonated with their curriculum. So this is this was a really amazing project, both in terms of the client, but kind of creating a space for kids to learn is a pretty uh, is a pretty special task. So you know, from one extreme uh, of a ground up building like um, Riverdale to a very different kind of project, we 
completed a major restoration of the Judd House in um, Soho. And this building is a, a significant cast iron building, contributing building in um, the uh, Landmarks District, cast iron district of Soho in New York. Um, but significant also in that it uh, was the home and studio of Donald Judd uh, from 1968 until 1994 um, when he passed away. And it's the site and location of where he really envisioned and started creating environments for um, permanently installed art. So our work here, unlike Riverdale, which is sort of exuberant and playful, I think our work at Judd House um, is indicative of another spectrum of our practice, which is actually quite quiet and um, reserved. This project is very much about a huge technical lift to take on with a, with a large team of collaborators to take on the um, challenge of allowing this building to be opened up to the public, um, given its state of, um, you know, the, its condition and the life safety and accessibility challenges that existed in this uh, historic structure when we started working with the Judd Foundation. The Judd Foundation was um, founded upon Donald Judd's death with the primary purpose of facilitating public access to permanently, these permanently installed spaces for art in both New York and Marfa. And so um, thinking about that core mission as part of our project was really important and essentially putting the building and the um, Judd's work in that building and his contemporaries work that are, is on display in that building at the forefront of our, of our, um, um, of our exercise or of our work. These are just showing photos of the cast iron at the facade. So it was, as you can see on the left, not in very good condition. More than like 1,300 pieces of this facade were removed. Many were restored. Um, they were sent to a founder. Many were restored. Some were recreated so that the, that facade could literally be taken apart and then be put back together um, to um, return it to a state of glory that obviously went through um, landmarks review and the like, the buildings on the National um, Registry of Historic Places. So it um, had a lot of uh, scrutiny as we were going through the process, but that was important for us because we wanted to make sure, obviously, that every decision was thoughtful, was quiet, and to the best of our ability, respected Donald Judd's vision for these spaces that he had created at the interior. Um, here you can see the kind of new window replacement on the exterior. The building is notable for, the, obviously, the percentage of glazing, like many amazing um, buildings in Soho, cast iron buildings in Soho. Um, we were really excited, uh, whoops, in the fact that um, we were able, in talking to Landmarks, to restore the building to the, the gray color that Donald Judd had, had painted it when he occupied the building, rather than its original color from when it was, um, when it was constructed. So having those kinds of conversations to pull off a project like this was was an important part of the process. The subseller and seller of the building are, are uh, the location for the Judd Foundation's offices. So here you're really seeing a little bit of ARO more in the forefront of thinking about the design of these spaces. But even in that, like the um, pine partitions here, Judd had a series of storage rooms that he had already created. We reused that wood and then mimicked that um, installation to create additional office spaces for the foundation. You can see here how amazing it is when you walk across glass, glass sidewalks in New York City, how much light can actually penetrate from that sky, sidewalk down two levels into the subcellar of a building. And so this building had amazing bones. We were really there to try to reveal what was great about it and hide all the things that um, Judd and the public don't really need to experience or see in accessing these spaces. So here, here, these are the doors into the Judd Foundation's offices and our new work in some of the stair staircases to help make the building accessible. And then when you emerge and you enter on the ground floor, this is one of the spaces that Judd used for temporary exhibitions. The building is really, um, you know, all of our effort was trying to restore it to uh, his vision 
uh, with these spaces for art. So the foundation uses this space for talks and lectures. In the corner, you can see the elevator, which is still a hand-operated rope elevator, which was refurbished and approved. That provides, provides accessibility to the upper floors. Um, and then in all of these other spaces, essentially our work, um, I mean, you can see some of it, which people probably don't like, but our work was really about integrating all of these technical requirements to allow the building to be um, operational. That obviously included HVAC upgrades, but one of the big challenges was actually life safety access and um, dealing with fire alarm systems and smoke systems so that the public could come into these floors and then um, egress safely. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So here you're seeing the dining level and looking into the kitchen. You can see how, how much light comes in through that facade. I mean, the windows were amazing. There were single pane windows that obviously, for energy reasons and because we introduced humidification into the building for the conservation of the art, um, we had to replace those with new wood double uh, insulated glass units. Um, but uh, the amount of light coming into the space is really tremendous. Here you can see the kind of challenges of working around, both with and around Don Hong Chud on a project like this. Uh, his piece here in the center in situ during construction and the kind of condition of the building as it was taken apart before it was reconstituted. So on a floor like this, every single floor Judd designed the finishes. He did the plaster, he put in the wood, he removed finishes where he didn't want to have them. So on this floor, recreating a plaster that matched what we were able to research from, from the archives and through field testing was the challenge. Um, while doing that with new, um, new layers for humidification in terms of the overall assemblies. And doing it in ways that integrated sensor, sensing, you know, sensors and such for very high, uh, like very sophisticated fire alarm systems um, within the architecture so that those things weren't visible to, to guests or to the public. Another place where that occurred is on the fourth floor. You can see a really important concept for Judd was opening up this floor and having a continuous staircase that connects the levels of the building, which of course is not very helpful for, for egress. So in this particular instance, we worked with Arab to do um, performance-based uh, computational fluid dynamic modeling of the smoke behavior in the building, um, which really showed here how smoke would gather without a fire shutter. So our proposal was to integrate this fire shutter so that people can safely egress, so that the staircase could remain open, which was Judd's intent, um, by having these uh, custom mechanical panels that basically flip out and, and kind of protect, um, pr keep the smoke back so that people can egress the building. All of these little decisions add up to what we hope is an experience that people really go there. They don't see all of that technical work. They see these very beautifully installed spaces for art. Here, recreating and reinstalling um, a fire escape, which is still one of the modes of egress from this building, obviously having to add a little bit of the fire um, exit signage. And then one of our favorite kind of stories from this whole process is we like to say that um, on, on the fifth floor, which is the sleeping chambers or the bedroom floor, there's no lighting on this floor except for the Dan Flavin sculpture. So we like to say that this is our most expensive emergency egress lighting that we've ever done because that's it. Like it's wired to the fire alarm system and it all got approved from in New York City, which is, which is kind of tough. This is a really exceptional building because of Judd's work there. So next time you're in New York, you should hopefully you know, try to visit it. Since uh, 2012, we've been doing um, work with Noel, and um, we met, um, actually we met in Washington DC, we, we were winners of the National Design Award from the Smithsonian in the same year, and has started this conversation about how to imagine and reimagine their flagship and um, showroom, uh, their flagship showroom and offices in New York City, as well as their first retail location. And since then, we've had this tremendous collaboration that has spread around to different sites around the country, including Houston, which was fun, so I've made more trips to Houston than I have to Dallas, obviously, I guess, since I said this was my first time. But thinking about the legacy of Hans and Florence Knoll and how Florence thought about the showroom design. On the left, you can see one of her historic designs. 
for us trying to imagine how we could take viewers through those showroom spaces and also re-envision how Noel related to their client base by saying the showroom is really seen as an extension of the office space. So when we imagine this, this move for them from, they were in what is now the Google building or the Port Authority building in Chelsea, huge big industrial building, and they were moving to, back to Midtown into a tower across multiple floors. So thinking about the challenges of distributing their personnel differently, but re-envisioning the showroom sequence so that their guests and clients could come through all of those spaces as part of part of visiting Knoll and learning about their product. This is a timeline in the front of the front of the New York City showroom that greets you when you first enter, where you kind of understand and learn about the legacy and history of history and impact of Knoll. And then integrating certain key elements that they had in their showrooms at the time, like their sample wall, which really uh, um, shows off the extremely robust collection of textiles that they have uh, and that they design in-house with, an with an amazing team. One of the things that we did in this project, which relates a little bit to that material exploration I was talking about earlier, is um, we saw that Knoll had all these great text tools and wall coverings, but they also had recently purchased Spinnybeck and Feltspout. So they had this new, these new collections of leather and felt, and we wanted to really showcase those things in applied um, locations in the project to really demonstrate how architects and designers could integrate this, these materials into their, into their work. So this is showing uh, one of those installations. We did a felt-wrapped stair. Again, the staircase being that place that brought people together and help, helped everyone at Knoll stay connected. They were worried about being spread across multiple floors. So a felt wrapped one on the ground floor or the second floor when you come in, and then a leather wrapped one further up to create this continuous circuit there for those visitors. This work um, was really also tied to thinking about a number of other custom wall finishes that we integrated into small collaborative rooms and office spaces on the floor plate. Here you can see kind of mock-ups for the staircase and the, and the fabric wall, but also these um, wall panels here, which at the time this mock-up is showing it with um, wood in the background, but we were thinking about these as acoustic finish, finishes and acoustic products. Here you can see that finally installed where the felt really becomes this luxurious material that lines these rooms and provides like a very quiet acoustic environment. We're fortunate in that that relationship with Knoll has really extended and we've been able to work with them in multiple cities, each city really bringing its own kind of context, its own um, personality, where we've talked to the sales team and the regional managers to try to understand who their client base is. This is San Francisco, much rawer space, you know, more into felt and less into leather, kind of um, um, trying to like target their uh, sort of software and tech industries. Or Houston, um, a little closer here in Texas, really powerful kind of sales location where we um, integrated, you know, white terrazzo and brass and leather <clears throat> into the design. So trying to let the um, local personality really inform how we think about each of these showrooms. So this has been, again, one of those, those thought partnerships that I referenced earlier, a really deep kind of engagement and collaboration with the client um, to roll out these different spaces, which we continue to work on with them, um, uh, which is a very fun, uh, fun exercise. This is Los Angeles where you can see um, a little palette informed by the sunset and the beach. Uh, but um, what you're also seeing in all of these is some different installations with felt and leather. And so here you can see custom, a custom sort of light and ceiling baffle installation, or here in some of those enclave rooms, another um, felt, felt and cork installation. And so emerging from this long-term collaboration, we also have launched or launched a um, collection with Spinnybeck Filtzfeld called the ARO Collection, which is a collection of acoustic architectural finishes. So this wasn't something we were thinking about when we said, let's just show off that you have this great product and we should integrate it into, into your showrooms. But we started a conversation about how to turn this into a modular product that other designers and architects could specify. Um, and so each year we launch new product into the family, but essentially it includes wall surfaces, modular wall surfaces, um, both smaller scale and larger scale, like smaller scale block or larger scale plank, baffle systems, um, standardized ones and arced ones like this, which are more custom, 
all of these with high performing um, acoustic properties, which has been uh, become an important part of our work uh, and sort of material exploration, but also an important part of many of our projects where we talk about the importance of kind of interior acoustics and healthy interiors. At a totally different scale, we still do single family houses. I said this earlier. So thinking about um, how to create very personal spaces for families or couples. And one of the things I've noticed over the past few years is that many of the many of our house clients, and we don't we don't have a ton of houses, so that means like a few of our house clients or that we've had in the past few years, they're actually um, couples who are creating houses as retreats. They're creating these as the house that they imagine that they're going to live in um, until the end of their lives and that they want to have to attract their older children to come back to so they really have a place to enjoy. And that means that these houses are also um, often on one story, flat, accessible, um, and you know, plan to envision that they will live there um, you know, efficiently as they age, which has been a really kind of exciting and interesting conversation for us to have with, with a number of different clients. This project is on this beautiful ridge in Connecticut, and you can see that the house is a linear kind of bar situated right on, right on that ridge that faces a valley with um, trees, which I'll show you in a second, and a clearing on the other side that you approach, you approach through uh, that has a swimming pool located within it. So it's not a huge site, but it has a vast view. So taking advantage of that view by organizing the house in a single bar, all flat, of course, um, with the um, bedroom wing on one side, the primary house on one side, split with a kind of foyer, an indoor-outdoor entry kind of foyer or pavilion, and then a guest wing, secondary wing on the other side for the, for the client's um, older daughters to return to. So basically, the house has these two um, um, porches, linear porches, that are the primary, primary kind of circulation, exterior circulation for each of those wings. This side, again, orienting to the view at the top, and then the pool here at the back. When you enter, this is entering along that view. So here you can see some of our exploration kind of with, with wood siding, which we uh, have played with over the years. But walking along that porch, seeing the view down to the left to the forest, and then approaching that center foyer space as you enter the building. It's, it's a simple, straightforward um, wood construction. This is the pool side of the building and the, and, the, and the hallway or that exterior hallway that faces the pool. Here you can see kind of looking through the living room to the view beyond. Um, simple wood construction with the flat roof, all accessible as I noted before. Um, and the idea of the two halves of the building was really the client said, I want to be able to shut down the one half so I'm only using energy and the second half I'm using energy. Um, and systems in the side of the building that I'm occupying most of the time. And then when we have guests, we turn on the other half of the building and the whole thing can kind of be lit up essentially. So this is a view through that um, entry uh, foyer, that indoor outdoor space that looks to uh, the valley beyond and that has large skylights integrated to make it feel light filled even though it's kind of partially, um, partially glazed and enclosed. And then once you're in the living room, um, looking through the glass, that full height glazing to see the to see the valley and the trees. So a really kind of simple, simple design, pretty straightforward and functional, I think, um, and something that they've been um, able to now enjoy, you know, over this past year, this past season, and spend more time out of the city and the country, which makes both of them two like um, diehard New Yorkers very very happy. You can see the master bedroom suite here on the right, uh, the linear kind of configuration of the building, and then the carport here all the way um, on the right hand side with that screen siding um, in front of it. And then the final little look down to the view. In People talk a lot, you know, I mentioned legacy with Noel, kind of thinking about the kind of history of an American company and how it represents that through its architecture and spaces, showrooms and offices. We're working with DIA Art Foundation right now as part of a larger project DIA has to revisit all of their existing sites, Chelsea, Soho, and Beacon. Um, in some of those sites, you know, as part of a larger capital campaign, some of those sites 
Um, our work is infrastructural in nature, you know, uh, providing new systems, re, you know, making the architecture more robust so that the experience of viewing the art can be, can be had by, by visitors. Um, in Chelsea, the project for us is a little bit more charged because we are kind of re, um, recreating the street level facades of the three buildings that they currently occupy. So um, Dia occupies uh, this site on West 22nd Street now, a, a six story building and then two single story structures all adjacent to each other. Um, they formerly, uh, formerly occupied a uh, building across the street on 22nd Street. And for those of you who know Dia, they, they're really known for um, taking over existing buildings and repurposing them for, the, for guests to experience essentially permanently installed pieces of art within those gallery spaces. So their identity has been tied very much to the buildings that they have occupied. And they were really one of the, the front runner of moving to Chelsea, you know, way before the kind of gallery craze that's there now and way be in before the Highland was present. Um, and they started um, creating these spaces before other gallerists were really uh, um, kind of emulating those moves. And so for us, one of the challenges in thinking about Dia and a facade for Dia is how to create something that was quiet and felt integrated with the kind of industrial warehouse character of those, those single story buildings. Um, and that reinforced the identity they already had uh, without feeling like every other, <laughs> without feeling like every other gallery in Chelsea, essentially. Even though they're not a gallery, they're, they're a foundation. Um, here you can see the three, the three ground floors of the building, the two single story structures here, 545 and 541, and then the six story building, five, 535. What we're doing with the project is expanding their public space, new lobby and bookstore, a large talk space on the ground floor, which they use for events and lectures, and also for um, um, performance pieces uh, and uh, uh, performance artists um, uh, installations. Um, and then uh, the two large uh, single story gallery spaces to the left. Um, this is the existing kind of street level facade of the six story building and the two single story buildings. In order to pull off the project, to support their mission about kind of bringing art in and out of these buildings and essentially to provide um, more robust mechanical systems and humidification to the interior of the galleries. We are, we are recreating these, these two facades and kind of reorganizing the base facade of this building. Um, so our project, our proposed facade, you can see the new ones are a little taller in scale, really to help deal with um, the scale of uh, these large openings that will allow art to be pulled in and out of the buildings, and also to use the pediment to help hide new infrastructural systems and HVAC that are happening across that ceiling. Um, but unified across all that facade uh, with a very sort of simple, carefully detailed brick masonry um, facade and large scale kind of industrial doors in this uh, location here, sliding glass doors, and on the right, a kind of bifold metal door to allow them to kind of create these installations with artists, um, these meaningful kind of collaborations with artists that they, that they have today. Here you can see this in section looking to the south, so the 535, the tall building, um, that ground floor space, and those, those two adjacent galleries. We're also working with Dia on the sixth floor for new um, offices, administrative offices, and a new library and education space on the fifth floor that they'll use for their education programming. They've been um, really tremendous to, uh, to work with. So here you can see a kind of preliminary view on the ground floor, looking into the bookstore through those new openings. You'll enter there to um, enter the galleries, um, moving in a little closer. And then inside, they have a bookshop in Beacon now, so really bringing that idea of the bookstore program to Chelsea to activate this space. To the right is that new talk space, and beyond is how you enter kind of enfilade to go into the adjacent galleries. Here you can see that large bifold door kind of open. When they have events, they can open up to the street. Some artists, you know, sometimes these spaces are completely enclosed, and other times they put art in that really relates to, um, to the sidewalk in the street, so it varies. Here's a view kind of looking back out through, the, through that opening to, um, to the streetscape. So large scale openings that connect 
you know, here taller on the one side, more intimate on the other, and really exposing the shell of the building. And again, a project about integrating infrastructure in a fairly quiet um, and careful way. This is um, 535, which is showing a bowstring, it's kind of revealing the wooden bowstring structure of the building, new skylights and everything, but essentially a pretty um, quiet shell for them to install art within. Um, at a very different scale, um, we completed a number of years ago um, a significant amount of research on rising water levels in New York's Palisades Bay. We did that with Guy Nordenson and Kefrit Sivit collaboratively, and that research formed the foundation for a show at the Museum of Modern Art called uh, Rising Currents, which looked at five sites around um, the harbor and envisioned ways of, uh, of rethinking resiliency within those sites to address uh, rising uh, water levels and storm surge. Our um, mark referenced like um, not a lot of building and a lot of making. All of this work kind of, not the initial, the earlier research, but the Rising Currents show and the effort that kind of led to this exhibit is work that happened in 2008 and eight after the kind of financial crisis. So there was this, you know, Barry Bergdahl at MoMA at the time had this idea to create this, um, to take all of that energy that wasn't necessarily going into built projects and to put it into meaningful research that, um, that uh, kind of informed how we think about our city and, and its future. Our project, uh, we were at site zero, which is the tip of lower Manhattan. Um, which is, was great for me because that's right where I live. <laughs> and um, and uh, we collaborated with, whoops, with um, Susanna Drake of D-Land Studio on a proposal that really rethinks um, urban infrastructure as a kind of new ecological, soft, resilient infrastructure surrounding the tip of lower Manhattan. So here on the left, you can see kind of an overlay of how the edge of Manhattan has changed from the 1600s sort of soft edge to a more built up industrial edge, you know, in the 1800s formation of piers and then ultimately what we have, have now, which is kind of transforming, but have now in lower Manhattan, which is a recreational edge, largely infilled, say with Battery Park City here to the, to the left, still defined by that hard seawall edge um, uh, that was introduced, you know, introduced over the years by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, one of the other challenges we have in New York City is being an older city. That's the red line here is that hard, that hard seawall. Being an older city, we have a combined storm and sanitary system. So with every heavy rainfall and every flood condition, sewage e is ejected into the river and into both the East River and the Hudson River. So for us, this project was very much about trying to solve the challenge of kind of water quality and the sewer system as well as um, as well as uh, rising water levels. You can see in the center the, the um, projected um, six feet of loss or six feet of sort of higher water level by 2100. And combined with that, the impact of a category two storm surge and those higher water levels um, here on the right. So how much of the island would actually be inundated, which of course, not to the extreme version on the right, but after this, when Superstorm Sandy hit, it was a Category 2 storm, and we were very inundated um, in, in many parts of Manhattan. So our project really envisioned, again, working with D-Land Studio, a soft, resilient um, system that both uh, with breakwaters here at the tip that sort of helped deal with storm surge, but essentially transforming Lower Manhattan's existing infrastructure into a new um, ecological infrastructure that both provided public amenity, but also um, helped manage absorption, essentially, and, and diversion of water within the street grid. So you can kind of see here um, that proposed section, you know, soft kind of wetlands at the edges, and then cuts within that make the streets very absorptive, channels that help divert water in places, and then hardened infrastructure to protect existing systems that, that occur below grade in New York City. And then in some instances, these deep cuts, in, in, some, in places often where slips used to exist, creating these deep cuts because we needed that much territory to actually 
envision productive wetlands um, you know, that they could take hold within this um, new cityscape. So this was sort of, um, you know, the sections are sort of uh, innovative in rethinking how we imagine public space in Lower Manhattan. Um, this diagram is just really talking about those different levels of streets and their, their, and their roles, you know, um, um, absorption and then tributaries that, that divert water back out to the city in a slower fashion in the event of a kind of storm surge situation or a flood situation. This was just the model that was installed um, at uh, MoMA during the show. Here, one of those wetland sections, you can see a new amenity spaces that are captured within it and the view of the tip of the island. And obviously now, you know, post Sandy, there is much more resiliency work going into many parts of Manhattan, including this like lower edge, which is, which is really exciting for the city. This project is all about being quiet. We did a, um, a major renovation of this existing building, also at an independent school in the Bronx called Ethical Culture Fieldston School. They have campuses in Manhattan and the Bronx. And this kind of amazing uh, concrete and stone and steel building um, that was their library and is now their learning commons, located at the center of their campus. Um, this building um, was one of the largest spaces where people could gather on their campus and was really defined by this great big open section, which I'll show you in a minute. And our challenge in this project was trying to balance <laughs> a desire to turn the building from the library into a more active learning commons, but to do that in a way that still kept like 50,000 books in the space and still allowed it to be very quiet because the librarians who are great collaborators for us um, wanted a quiet environment, essentially. So how you kind of promote collaboration within high school students and have the place stay quiet at the same time and kind of maintain the openness of the space. Those were our big challenges. So here you can just see some of our, some diagrams about how we thought about those types of study, but also organizational ones that really said, how do we create open spaces for collaboration that could still be quiet and then, and then take closed rooms to help promote collaboration that might be noisy. So really simple and important thinking about Organizing spaces acoustically, which your acoustician will tell you, you should always first separate loud things so that they don't create noise together. But sometimes that's hard to do, especially especially in New York. And then also thinking about how to integrate all those fifty thousand volumes of books in a flexible fashion, because they said, you know, we know that the nature of the uh, learning commons will evolve, but right now we have this collection. It's important to our curriculum. We're a school that is about the book and about writing and research. And we want to have all these volumes, even though it's kind of at odds with the idea of a learning commons where we also want to create all of this collaborative space for students to, to work within. And so um, the building um, situates itself looking out over this great quad. We replaced the glass with um, bird safe glazing, so all new glazing, restoration of the whole exterior of the building. But importantly for us, this is a new link that just ties the building to uh, the art building here adjacent to it. Importantly for us, that was very much about allowing the students to also feel tied to the campus and connected to the outside. Again, this is a really beautiful um, campus in the Bronx, and so taking advantage of that character and quality of the landscape that uh, defined the interior. When you enter the building, only part of the ground floor is excavated. You enter, there's gallery space and classroom space, and then the staircase that leads you up, and you can see here one of two different um, custom GFRG um, ceiling systems that we created to help deal with sound in these open spaces. Um, the floor plans are large and open. That's that first stair coming up. This is the balcony edge here, and then the second stair that goes up to the second floor. So kind of creating really one large open area, flexible stacks, all on low ones, all on wheels, large, uh, tall ones, ones that could be removed, and thinking about that ceiling system, which is for acoustics, but also integrating lighting in it in a way that allows the bookshelves, which previously had been hardwired, 
All of these bookshelves can come out. There's no wiring integrated into the shelves, so maintaining the ceiling heights and integrating the lighting in a way that they could take the shelves out over time and not have to do a major, another major renovation of the kind of architectural character and shell of this building. You can see here also this great sense of openness from the one side to the quad on the left, and then to the rear side on the right, they have exterior kind of teaching and learning spaces that ring the building. So maintaining that sense of openness was really important in the design. And was what was actually at stake for us in the design, like the, the owner and the client said like, well, I think we should probably just enclose the balcony, enclose the top floor, because that would help deal with the sound issue if it was all glazed in. And we kept having this conversation about the fact that this is like one of the nicest things about this building is it has this beautiful section and you have this large open space that supports your community. So can't we come up with a solution to deal with the sound that doesn't require us to enclose the whole thing? So some of that was programmatic organization. Some of that, some of that was just smart, um, you know, thinking about the furniture solutions. And then some, a lot of that has to do with um, the ceiling, that GFRG ceiling. So you saw the one here in the sort of diagonal pattern. That diagonal pattern is used up here too. And then on the main section, there's another, another linear pattern. It's basically open and porous. It allows sound to move up it and get caught in the structure. We have softer, softer surfaces up here for sound. And then the sound kind of gets trapped. And if it doesn't get trapped, what gets reflected is much more dispersed and much quieter. So trying to organize then relative to that quiet study areas and then um, collaborative rooms that are private um, or enclosed on the one side. So here you can see different ways that they're occupying the building. And one of the things that they also had to do was collaborate in large groups in the open area. So trying to integrate the infrastructure to allow that to happen. And again, think about how the ceiling could help, help with the overall sound levels in the space. This is that great, that great section, the open railing instead of the enclosed glass, but new glass railing um, that allows everyone to see from here down to this great view of the quad and really creating great spaces for quiet work uh, and collaboration that are communal, but also ones that are much more intimate and in scale for the individual as you move up through the building. Um, and then those collaborative rooms on one end. You can see that the building is um, fairly robust. It was it's a really great kind of structure to work with. Here are views through the glass to the other side. That's a sort of outdoor learning area um, and like open collaborative tables. And then that view looking back um, through that um, bird safe glass here at the bottom. Finally, last couple minutes. I know I'm just, at, it's almost eight o'clock. Um, we are working on Roxo Chapel in Houston, um, which has been a really, really um, a nice uh, collaboration. First working with the chapel on thinking about uh, planning of their site and now working on one of the first phases of that plan. And, and here, um, for us, what's exciting is engaging with a client that um, has this amazing building and also has paired with that um, a, um, mission to kind of promote you know, both contemplation as well as social, ac social action. And so um, the environment you know, originally intended um, in the Dominial's first um, kind of um, concept for the chapel and belief in the idea that there could be meaningful um, transformative spaces created with integration of modern art. Um, this is a view of the chapel before the restoration work um, began. And you can see the Rothko panels that surround the interior of that building. I'm sure many of you maybe have visited it. And then this um, baffle at the top, or this, they kind of call it the oculus at the top. And one of the things that is challenging about this project, besides the sort of technical issues, and one of the fundamental challenges for the chapel as an organization is that they are so successful in their programming and their events and in the uh, kind of special um, gatherings that they host, that all of that activity that promotes their mission is undermined a little bit by um, the desire to also allow people to come into this place and enjoy it on an individual basis and to experience both the chapel, the architecture, and the panels, and the Rothko panels. Um, 
in a quiet manner. And so a big part of our work is both about the chapel and then also about thinking about their larger um, master plan and how to take some programming out of the chapel so that it can better support viewing the panels and individual contemplation while the institution can still hold all of these other um, events. So very quickly, I'm just going to say the building itself, this is in a section of the existing building before the um, restoration started. You can see here at the top um, these panels that actually closed off the skylight and the skylight, actually, before I talk about the skylights, here you can see um, Rothko with the pa paintings that he painted in New York City in his own skylit studio, but the skylight in New York City was, of course, older, dirtier, had a scrim over it. So um, the coloration in the paintings is very deep and dark, for, for those of you who have seen it, and very subtle. And one of the challenges in the project is when it first opened, the light coming through this skylight in Texas was very bright and harsh, and the paintings um, were kind of, they realized very quickly that the paintings were at a little bit of risk. So much of our work, you can see here, installations of skylight that have occurred over the years, and the most recent one in the 90s, there was a bigger restoration of the chapel, and they installed this oculus, but one of the challenges with this is that it's, it feels a little bit oppressive when you're in the space, or it felt a little bit of oppressive when you're in the space, and continuously the complaint has been that still experiencing the panels themselves is really challenging. One of the challenges there is that, that right now, in the, in the existing configuration, there's a really dramatic drop-off in illumination when you enter the chapel, and what we're trying to do, we're working with George Sexton on the lighting, is to smooth that out so that your experience entering allows your eyes to adjust so that your eyes can see the darker palette within the paintings, and that adjustment starts on the outside, working through the landscape, and then as you move into the interior, um, based on the reconfiguration of the new, um, the new skylight. This is a mock-up that George Sexton did at, in DC at 1 12th the scale of the actual um, top skylight of the building. You can see kind of uh, tests thinking about how light's gonna pass through this assembly and this louver. And then here, just a view again showing original, the 1992 kind of version of installation and our proposed installation, which has a, a layered and louvered skylight that combines natural light, natural diffuse light with artificial illumination to even out the lighting across the surface of the panels. So very quickly, the chapel in its context, Dominial is here, University of St. Thomas is here, the chapel has these bungalows and these ones to the north, Barnett Newman is here in the, in the trees, and um, our project is really looking at restoration of the chapel as part of the first phase that's underway right now, um, and also the creation of a new um, welcome pavilion that will take some of the program that created, kind of um, intruded on the experience entering the building, they added a vestibule to house some of that kind of welcome program, and remove it from the chapel so that the chapel can kind of be returned to its most kind of original design intent for experiencing the panels and, and for private contemplation. So we're working with Thomas Woltz on the landscape design. Um, here you can see meditation garden. In the final phase, meditation garden. Obviously the broken obelisk is here already. The restored chapel and then the welcome house, energy house, program center, and office and archive buildings and guest house. So over time, the um, um, bungalows that are actually here will be removed as we're able to build these additional buildings um, that are phased in the project. The sequence imagines that people will arrive at that welcome house, move through the site, allow the treescape here to help bring the, their um, light levels down and help eyes start to adjust, and then you'll enter the building and then walk back through the um, garden to kind of reflect on that experience. And then here are some views of the um, the Welcome Center, all of this is um, imagined or being created in the case of the Welcome Center with um, board and batten siding that really kind of uh, looks to the context of bungalows, the historic bungalows in the neighborhood and the scale of those bungalows to create this new, um, this new set of buildings. This is looking past the Welcome House to the Program Center. In section, you can see the building's quite low in the same scale as the chapel itself and then from the program center looking back across to the chapel in the distance, and of course, like the nighttime view. Thank you. <laughs>